even most people, of man-made claims to religion, will tend to pretend that politics is separate from religion, but it isn't. There are individual and collective duties that we need to look at. Duties in regards to establishing a theocracy. What rights the individual constitutionally has in such a theocracy? And what are the duties upon the individual to the state? Islamic law regards all aspects of life, but the state are individuals do not enforce most of these things on the individual. Their duty is to encourage what is right and discourage what is wrong. There are certainly instances where ritual, morals, and ethics are conditional, are specialized. The divine command for each age is detailed in such a way that everything is given spiritual advice. Collectives are greater than anything that an individual can do. And it's important to not just skip as a society to punishing people. They need to establish a just social system first. The existence of the fire beings and the clay beings is for the purpose of worshiping the Creator. And whether the duties are to God, are to the creation, these duties are such that they are according to the abilities we have in our circumstances. Some will be prevented, are enabled when they wouldn't be through their own conscious exception of religion. The Islamic State rules by consent. It rules in a way in which it at least puts its hand forward to get along with other countries. Constitutions are symbols and arrangements of the power of the government. In the Maliki and Shafi school of thought, there's sort of a pagan approach in that use and development of land is essential to the division of land. And this is by permission of the state, directly at some point. It's not required for a population to be majority Muslim or even have a single Muslim in it for it to be part of an Islamic state. What is required is that there is complete freedom to learn and practice Islam in that area. And while people are still limited to what they would do according to their resources, it's not that I want to practice this aspect of religion with this over here. It's not my property yet, but then it's my... No. Um, Islam calls the curses down upon those who fight for land, who fight for slaves or other resources, who fight to force conversion. 
And there's a Hadith Qudsi that brings up those four points. You know, a Hadith Qudsi is, tradition says that Muhammad said, that God said, a purpose of an Islamic state is that it's good to the people. That it goes beyond the prejudices of gender and race and all that. Obedience to government and Islam is limited to what is good and what is fair. Now, this is based on the verse that emphasizes the belief in what God has revealed and what God has inspired, and then those in authority over us. So, those in authority over us can't order us to do what is wrong according to religion. And on top of that, those in authority are supposed to do what is fair as well. Just like, particularly in the family, you do what is fair. And as a rule, even there, legislating your own personal tastes. So Islam isn't democratic like that, that it's, it's, it's limited into the idea that it's not about anybody's personal taste. Muhammad had favorite foods and clothes and stuff, but he didn't require that on anybody in any way, shape, or form. The rulers must consult the people that are ruled. Everybody is supposed to work towards protection. That's why even the non-Muslim is a protected class. Now, some will say there's such as the permitted class. You know, those of religions or claim to have no religions that are other than the scripture-based religions. A person could argue very literally that the groups that we may call the Jews and the Christians, um, the Arabic words kind of go beyond just those two groups with those words. Um, the people who uh, seek out the truth in things, you could say, um, or they go from this path to that path. Um, the Zoroastrians are quite literally brought up in the Quran. So some paths also may have enough to be guided, but in general they would be considered permitted people. There's no such thing as, oh, they're going after women. They're, the, uh, if there's rules for modesty and the men break their modesty or whatever in public or whatever, that's the thing too. But see, um, there are certain leeways in terms of certain places of worship that aren't Muslim places of worship. And what they, how they dress and what they do and all that stuff. And no, Islam doesn't require specific styles. Now, if you go on pilgrimage, you are doing a specific style of dress. The women are particularly plain. The men were, you know, only white clothes. And... But as a rule, we're not talking about styles. We're talking about principles. But Islamic dress only, you know, if you're not in a funeral or a place of worship, that's Again, there's some leeway in society to what's actually allowed. Now, um, these naked parades and stuff like that that are done in my country, um, you know, that, of course, would not be tolerated. Are the performers who go out and prance around in their underwear and all that, that, that again, would be something that they'd go, yeah, no, that's, we're going to put a stop to this, too. And there's not going to be silly loopholes of statutes and stuff like this that, oh, prostitution's okay if you take pictures or record it. Or, it's like, what? No, it's it's just as wrong. So the whole uh, legal or not thing, it, it, we, don't, we don't play that game. There is indirect and direct elections involved. You could say that... Abu Bakr was subject to a limited election 
and Umar was appointed, Uthman was chosen by six, and it was fully open to the community for Ali Hassan Hussein, and well, there was probably others that were pretty much chosen by the people. There are different opinions about some of this stuff, but as far as the direct sayings themselves, certainly the leader of the state being one chosen is there, but somebody qualified, certainly not just any random person in the crowd can lead. People complain about, oh, the non-Muslims, not. it's like, if they haven't agreed to the Constitution, how can they, you know, and they don't believe in it enough that, that they wouldn't change it if they could. You know, how, how can you allow those people to be rulers of your country, right? When there are judgments, it's not like some morality police wandering around with sticks just looking for an excuse to hit people. You know, things are according to evidence, and things are impartial. That No matter what your wealth or political status, that you're treated the same in court. So all these narrations about best of us and son of the best of us and all, this is not appropriate behavior. And that, yeah, the, the ruler of the state would get his way in court when his position isn't any better than anybody else's. That's, that would not be acceptable in an Islamic society, an actual Islamic society. Don't just say, oh, there's a bunch of Muslims, it must be an Islamic society. No, that's not how it works. Popular and political Islam, as they call it, this is not the Islamic way. The people in positions to make rulings should be able to refer directly to the Quran and the authentic sayings of Prophet Muhammad. They should be able to philosophize the contemporary applications of such. Things that involve the government require consulting the government officials. But as far as your personal practice of your regular religious duties and the more universally understood ones, it shouldn't require uh, consulting of any sheikh or whatever. You, you go ahead with following whatever verses and whatever there are. Um, certainly, organizing a collective towards anything so you can't just start a war because you know like for example they could perform they could put something on the news and you could come to all these conclusions because of this skewed way of talking that makes the lie sound like it's saying something that it's not or they could be honest and it sounds like a lie but you fall for it as if what it sounds like is what the thing is and People could end up committing some just horrible offenses and stuff like this. So it should be put to evidence. You don't just run about vigilantes or you and your buddies go over and start some battle with a handful of people from some other neighborhood. That's just not the way of Islamic society. The lowest of society, socially and economically, can redress those who are of the highest part of society. But then again, one of the things that we don't do or shouldn't do is make a big focus about stuff like the particulars of right and wrong, right? Um, that you're trying to find all their little faults and stuff like this, or you're trying to expose people's faults. A ruler or a judge that does not attempt to rule by what God has revealed and God has inspired his prophet Muhammad to say are considered as tyrants and the goal is to shift away from their rule. As far as things like traffic and safety 
sort of considerations. Certainly, people who are experts in these fields should be the ones consulted. Nowadays, we have so-called social justice causes that are led by celebrities rather than people who are experts. Like, I think, very particular about the environmental stuff, and how people are paid tens of millions of dollars, either because of their former political rank, or because of their connections to someone even more powerful than any president. Um, but, but again, their celebrity status, basically being an itwit that didn't finish school, um, not because of any legitimate reason, just, you know, oh, I don't want to finish school because everything is all so bad in society. No, well, I mean, if you're being abused in school, that's one thing, but, you know, not not her reason. Um, but they didn't want to listen to some middle-aged experts that have written dozens of books themselves and uh, peer-reviewed and all that stuff, and they didn't want to look at NASA charts and the and the Weather Channel data and stuff like this. They didn't want to listen to those sort of people. They wanted to listen to, you know, the beautiful people that they put on the TV, right? Now, I'm not criticizing them for being the beautiful, but you know what I mean? That's That was their characteristics, just like this diversity, equity, inclusion thing. Islam has a equal but different way of looking at things. You don't totally even things out so that people with certain abilities don't get rewarded for that, but you don't keep people from uh, to the point where they're in total poverty or they don't have their needs fulfilled either. Um, you don't downcast men or exalt women for whatever their or, or the other way around forever uh, for the physical and psychological ways in which they are generally superior to each other. But overall, it balances out, right? And whether a government official or otherwise, it's important to try to establish impartial parties or to have proper representation from both. But that doesn't mean that Islam has the modern concept of prosecuting our defense attorneys. No one is allowed to twist things towards the side of innocence or guilt. Not the parties that are accused, not the accusers, not those who work for either side. And of course, there's a more stringent categorization of finding somebody guilty beyond doubt. Um, we need to Acknowledge the distinction between having different levels of authority and tyrants. People that just use their power to totally override and have their decision be what it's going to be and be stubborn shouldn't be rulers. Censorship is not allowed as stopping different opinions. Like some modern states will ban most Islamic literature. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Most Islamic literature is banned in some countries. Now, this, this book is from Malaysia, right? So we, you know, it's, it's one of those better countries at that. But like if you go on pilgrimage, you may find that most of the hadith, uh, most of the books with the sayings of Prophet Muhammad are not allowed. Most of the scholars of the early times are not allowed. There's a minority that is allowed. Now, the bigger books tend to be allowed, but, you know, the idea that they don't allow even the publication of some of the books are collections of the people who knew Muhammad, that you see their names in the Hadith books, but their actual sayings not hundreds of years, uh, not a hundred or two or three hundred years later of tradition saying that, well, this person was one of the people who passed it on. Those actual people, we have some of their writings, 
Some of the countries in which these writings are stored don't allow the publication or the distribution of those writings themselves. Now, you don't just violently remove rollers the first thing you have. So, you know, again, that's another misconception that people have. But when you see the unlawful bloodshed, the destruction and oppression of religion, then things lead in that direction, right? But again, you'd be wise about it. You don't just well, a couple of us can kill a few of them, uh, of them, or maybe more than that, the, and, and then you start the war. No, this is not, this is not the approach either. As I say in my disclaimer, I'm not advocating breaking anybody's law or anything like that. Here, I'm just saying there's limits to the Islamic view that they just don't. Um, as soon as you get a few people together, you're trying to, you know, th that that approach is you try to gain support to practice and learn Islam over anything else. So if your actions interfere with that, then you're not really serving the cause in the first place. This is a difficult thing to summarize, but you know, I think you understand what I mean, right? In general, a person shouldn't seek out government positions. Now, one can seek out the training to become qualified for those positions. And some of these government positions can be appointed by others. You don't want, for example, a popular vote that puts in someone that's going to legislate or rule, you know, you know, make judgments according to the popularity it is a duty for anybody who elects or appoints to pick the best person for the job. The most efficient with the state resources is one of the key qualifications. Politics to get rich or to pay for your vacations or something like this is not an allowable thing in the Islamic vision. Personal property, bodily autonomy, in a way that doesn't inflict upon others. And honor are all rights that every individual inherently has. Most things that even Islam forbids, Islamic law also forbids enforcement of it beyond just saying, hey, dude, this isn't right. You know? And those things like theft and murder and, you know, the, those crimes that undeniably hurt somebody, and I don't just mean hurt their feelings, um, or put society at risk unduly and to prevent the further risk and the more serious crime, those are dealt with. These are dealt with in a way that discourages people and doesn't harbor crime like the prison systems do. Islamic states protect freedom of conscience and they protect the right for people to practice their own religion and places of worship in particular. To be a part of Islam in belief and practice is a choice. Or to not be is also a choice that, you know, is, is not enforced. And it's not for anybody other than oneself. Everybody gets what they strive for. So no punishing the children for the parents or the parents for the children. Unless, you know, you got some little kid and it's like, control your kid or, you know, that's that sort of thing. So as far as that can be done, you know, parents could be held liable. But, you know, ultimately everybody gets what they strive for. And that includes their influence.
landlords and employers are to do the rights for their leasers and their employees. And if they withhold, well, that's to get that. But strikes and withholding because you want to change the condition of the agreement to something that wasn't agreed upon and that sort of thing, that, that isn't right to do. You, you can move if you don't want to um, be a good leasee anymore. You can quit your job if you don't want to be employed by the employer anymore. But if they're not paying you right, if they're not taking care of the place or doing, holding up their end of the business agreement, you know, that's, that's a different story. But, you know, this, this thing where if, there, if there's some trend of something going around and you just, you know, don't do your job as, you know, that's not right. If you don't want to be forsaken as a people, you need to call out those in charge. You need to say, hey, this is not right, what they're doing with our tax dollars and that sort of stuff. Freedom of speech does not include slander. It doesn't include endangering pranks. And it shouldn't be used to blaspheme or to mock. It shouldn't be used in a treasonous way. And one thing that's obvious that it's not something enforceable, but again, it's a should um, issue. Well, I mean, no treason. That's that's something the government can get involved with. But the, uh, you know, telling state secrets or doing stuff that can get people hurt or killed of your community or whatever, you know, that that the government should deal with. A lot of things are the government should deal with things like supporting the death penalty for child molesters and rapers and uh, people who torture to a certain degree and murderers and all that sort of stuff. Um, well, all that sort of stuff can include a lot more than what's actually proper, but you know what I mean. That the government should deal with these criminals properly. Now, things that could be considered psychological abuse are just overstating you know, the people that do too much bragging are about how much better they are than others and all that other stuff. This isn't a right use for your freedom of speech. So it's important that some things are discouraged, whether or not the state um, allows it or not. Like I say, you're a sociopath if you wait to find out whether to do or not do something, whether or not it's legal. In an Islamic state... Good is done for the present, you know, the close-at-hand people. Because certainly, how can you do what's good for the world if you're not doing good for, what, for your own country? But people are going to say, oh, they're only doing good for their country and the Muslims. And it's like, yeah, but they're doing good for everybody else too. The state is required to take care of those with needs and people who pay taxes certainly some people are so poor that they should be given a total break some a partial break but there shouldn't be so many taxes that those who know how automatically turn trying to find loopholes there shouldn't be those loopholes if you're charitable you're charitable and that has nothing to do with your taxes. And what the state gathers to um, relatively minimally maintain its bureaucracy and its organization, it's done in such a way that it enables the Muslimin to give their religious alms and other people to give their religious alms, which tend to be much higher, 
Um, and sometimes the state can collect and distribute these things, but the various religious communities should have the freedom to, you know, have things distributed and collected in a sound way for their community. Islamic states do not fight other countries just because they're not part of the Islamic state. And by Islamic state, I don't mean Daesh, Daesh. You call it Daesh because it isn't an Islamic state. I mean something founded by one government's organization and led by members of another government's organization in both its founding and to this day. You know, it's, it's obvious we're dealing with something other than an Islamic state. Particularly, an Islamic state totally is supposed to agree with the Quran. That's, again, why you need people knowledgeable. And most religions, you can't do that because what they have is their religious text has contradictions and such. Whether you do or don't do something, it isn't about what you like. And what you call others to, it isn't about whether it personally pleases you or displeases you. Certainly those are appropriate um, factors in life, but we're not psychopaths either. The jizya, or the head tax, wasn't required on people just for being of a different religion, although there are certain allowances of things that they will not be required and things that will be required um, because of that different status. Um, but the jizya was not imposed on people just because they were non-Muslim. They were of people who started a war. And in general, the Muslim mean they try to call on and say, hey, hey, we, you know, here's some changes that, that really need to be made or else there might be a war here. I um, mean, you need to stop the, the murders and the persecution in this regard. Maybe we can call, call a peace or a truce or something before that's the case. Um, a so-called good politician in my country was recently called out for well, I mean, recently proved that they don't want any permanent ceasefires. How, how, how can you not want any permanent ceasefires? You, you, you know, um, and there's the oath of allegiance, you could say, for marriage, that certain conditions are laid down there. Now, the state requires more in some ways and less in others. And when efforts need to be made in society, you know, you just don't say, oh, well, I gave money or I fought or whatever. It's like, do you have ability in body and finances? Then that's what you put forward to defending yourself. Again, in the Islamic vision, it's kind of like that thing in the Bible that says don't fight for your country. Um, you fight to defend.